Okay, so today we're looking at Egyptian art um, and the differences that took place um, compared to uh, what we saw with Mesopotamia. Uh, so first we want to just look at the themes that we're going to be seeing uh, through um, the lecture. The first is uh, the role and structure of kingship or pharaoh. Uh, the pharaoh is the term essentially for kingship. Um, so I will be using Pharaoh o over king simply because it's a good identifier between Mesopotamia kingship and Egyptian kingship. So that way if I'm saying Pharaoh, you know I'm talking about kingship within Egypt. If I'm saying kingship uh, within Mesopotamia, right, then it's, it's within Mesopotamia. Um, and then the afterlife is a significant theme that's going to dominate um, Egypt, uh, Egyptian art, and then power, which you could put under um, the kingship and pharaoh, but uh, it's referenced quite a bit within their art, so I put it as a separate. But if you put it as a subset with the pharaoh, that works as well. Daily life is something that is showcased a lot. Um, we'll look at, at why. There's specific reasons for that. Um, and then the gods. So these are the main themes um, that we're going to be looking at. So the first part of what we want to uh, examine is just the geography and structure of Egypt and how that shaped Egyptian life because it really influenced both Mesopotamia and how their culture and art developed. Um, Mesopotamia wasn't protected uh, by natural geographical uh, regions from uh, uh, making it, uh, they didn't have uh, like with Egypt where it was harder to invade and consequently uh, they were invaded a lot more. Um, you also had Mesopotamia um, that was um, a lot more uh, harsh and uh, violent in, in terms of climate and weather and geography in general. Uh, so no natural protections. And, and that why we're looking back at Mesopotamia for just a second is because um, it, it's important to see how um, this influenced their uh, development. So harsh and unpredictable. Um, and then you did have more of a violent uh, weather and then of course with uh, uh, attacks and inv invasions. And so we see um, not only did they have a much more negative view and outlook on life, but then their art tended to focus a lot more on warfare and kingship where you'll notice that while power is present in a theme with Egypt, uh, warfare is not. That does evolve a little bit in the New Kingdom um, because of the geography or at least uh, resources by humans to access the geography changes. Um, but for most of Egypt, Egypt and Egyptian art, you don't have a theme of warfare. And you do with Mesopotamia because of um, that geography. So one of the things first for Egypt is that it was like an island. It was not actually an island, right? So don't, don't uh, put on there that Egypt was an island, but it had protection like an island would have uh, based on the um, geography uh, around it. You had the sea, the desert, and then the river, all of which provided natural barriers from invasion. And especially in the earlier kingdoms, when you didn't have the um, technology to surpass that. Again, one of the reasons why it changes in the New Kingdom some is because uh, human advancement had new technology that allowed them to bypass some of those natural barriers. Um, but Egypt's going to be much more protected um, and they don't end up having to have their focus be on warfare um, because they weren't invaded uh, very often um, because it was difficult to do. Uh, and the sea uh, provided natural stopping points with uh, uh, large-scale invasions. They, in their early kingdoms, 
you just don't have the uh, technology with ships to transport large troops. The desert, of course, uh, being difficult uh, to uh, uh, traverse uh, for any kind of distance. And Egypt, well, we'll look at the map in just a second, was surrounded by that. And then the Nile uh, actually had, actually, let's go look at the um, uh, map now. The Nile had uh, um, uh, cataracts near Nubia, which um, made it impossible to sail all the way uh, on the Nile. So here you can see, right, you have the seas, which provided this protection and creates only this narrow area for invasion, which becomes easy to defend. And then you have uh, the desert, the Sahara Desert over here, and the uh, um, and then within Egypt, and then the Arabian Desert uh, over by Mesopotamia. These uh, aren't going to be easy uh, areas to traverse. And then the Nile uh, within Nubia, there were cataracts near uh, Nubia, which meant uh, they had if you were going to uh, try to be on boats and um, sail up the Nile. Uh, to invade or sail down the Nile um, to invade, you would have to get out, walk and carry the boats, and then get back onto the Nile. Um, for the map, and um, when we're looking at the um, different uh, locations, you have, uh, you can see here, Lower Egypt at the top, Upper Egypt uh, near the bottom, and this is often reversed to what people kind of think, right, because we think North is up, south is down, but it's based on the flow of the river, right? So I said it wrong that first time of saying sailing up. They're sailing down the river. And, and so lower Egypt with the delta, which spread out into branches at the end, um, was the, uh, that was the direction of the river. So upper Egypt is in the southern region of Egypt. Lower Egypt is in the northern region. Of Egypt. So these geographical uh, features provided uh, a sense of protection uh, and security to Egypt um, that Mesopotamia didn't have. And consequently, their outlook was much more positive. Their gods were friendlier. And they don't have that focus uh, on warfare. Now, the th this uh, these different features uh, emphasized a philosophy that developed in Egypt called Mat. Mat was central to um, everything, um, and it was both a philosophy and a goddess. We're going to look at it in in terms of a philosophy. Uh, and there, what there isn't one um, word that is a translation for it. Rather, it's a series of them: truth, balance, just, uh, justice, harmony. That everything has its place in the world uh, and is where it's supposed to be, and that the gods have helped with that. And so, this philosophy uh, shapes um the whole structure of of the various kingdoms um place in the world this well we're going to look at um how um it, it uh, ultimately structured um in the the kingdoms we're, we'll talk a little bit more about the development of the kingdoms in just a minute but i want to um put uh, how Mott was viewed in each kingdom because it does evolve, right? It's not a static thing. The definition here it, it stays the same, but how it's viewed in Egypt changes. And that uh, we see that direct influence in uh, Egyptian art with the new kingdom. The old and middle kingdom were similar with how Mott was viewed. Um, and so the art doesn't change drastically, but by the new kingdom, Mott has a very different view, um, and that does directly influence, uh, the art that they use. So in the old kingdom, the belief was that Mott was present, it was present in the world, 
um, and things were good. In the Middle Kingdom, you had the belief that Mott was restored. And the reason that this changed is that there are periods in between, it's what shifts from old to middle. The first intermediate period was one uh, where they were invaded uh, by the Hittites and the Hittites took over for a while. When they overthrew them, the Egyptians overthrew them, then the Middle Kingdom starts and Mott is restored. The New Kingdom, so you have in between, right, the second intermediate period. And the second intermediate period, um, that was when uh, the Hiskos uh, were in charge. And then the New Kingdom is when they overthrew them. The second intermediate period shattered the faith in Mott. Um, and so what happens with this is then the belief was is that Mott was lost in the present world. And instead, they moved it to religion. All right, so we're going to come back and examine this when we're looking at um, the emphasis on the pharaoh and the art in the Old and Middle Kingdom versus uh, how you have this change that does take place um, in um, the religion as well as um, uh, some of their art. Um, so Mott played a significant role in that. And then uh, lastly, with geography, we mentioned it with the, with this, the characteristics of the island, but the Nile was important. Uh, the saying is that, uh, that the Nile is Egypt because uh, it otherwise would just be desert, right? The Nile is what provided the fertility for agriculture. And so not surprising, uh, the Nile was not only a god, but something that was revered and was depicted um, in art quite a bit. Uh, in, in scenes of daily life, in scenes of, of with the pharaohs, um, you, uh, but especially daily life, they tended to showcase daily life around the Nile because it was used for agriculture, it was used for uh, fishing, it was used for transportation and travel. It was very central to uh, Egyptian life. Um, so that's, that's looking at then um, the geography. There are a few stages of development of Egypt. So I already mentioned the kingdoms, but I want to um, at least set up what those, those different uh, periods were. Uh, you have hunting and gathering uh, period, just like Mesopotamia or, or, or hunting and gathers before Mesopotamia. Um, and then it shifts to agriculture and you do get um, city-states. However, uh, they shift to two kingdoms rather than um, individual kingdoms. And the reason for this has to do with the more homogenous structure of Egypt. The Nile, uh, because they could travel it, uh, uh, allowed them to spread the Egyptian culture and this sense of unity as Egyptians throughout all of Egypt. And so people took to a unification of two kingdoms relatively easy rather than independent city-states with individual kings like Mesopotamia. Um, and the two kingdoms, it, they were Upper Egypt and Lower Egypt. And you had a king... Uh, for both of those. Now it shifts to the Pharaoh with unified Egypt. This is then now where you have the Pharaoh as the one and only king of um, Egypt. Um, we see in the art the unification of Egypt with the Narmer palette. So let's take a look at that um, actually, let me write the key components of it, uh, and then um, we will we'll take a look. It has a hierarchical scale, which um, 
the hierarchical scale is used a lot in Egypt. Um, and this is almost always connected to the Pharaoh. And there's a reason for that with based on the structure of the Pharaoh and, and the belief of, of um, what the Pharaoh was. So um, we'll take a look at that role of the role of the Pharaoh in a minute as well. But you see, anytime you see hierarchical scale, um, you know, we talked about those components already, the idea of emphasizing the importance of, of that person or thing over everything else. Uh, it both was a connection to political power as the, the ruler, but also the gods. So you had a combined connection with that. And, and again, we saw a few examples in Mesopotamia, but what was more common was much like if you're looking at the standard of Ur, uh, it was minimal. Uh, in Egypt, they it were the pharaohs were almost always displayed as significantly larger than um, everyone else. The other thing um, that you had was um, that there were, it was uh, had different registers, so it has a narrative to it. Um, and the registers, again, are the, the idea of, of a piece of art where you have it broken into three sections and there are actual lines that are separating those to see that difference. So you provides a, a sense of narrative and um, time as you're going through the registers. So let's look at, um, and, and of course this had, if you're looking at um, the, the themes, the role of Pharaoh and power as well. And it does have the gods, so it actually has a lot of the uh, components. The Narmer palette um, was um, created uh, in order to showcase the unification of Egypt, the, the battle from um, the upper and lower Egypt into a unified Egypt. Uh, here you just have with the, this slide, it's just giving you the dates of the various kingdoms. So we're looking at the Narmer palette is uh, in this location here, right at the start of the beginning of the Old Kingdom. So here's what it looked like. It's two-sided. This is one side and then we'll look at the other. Obviously, you should uh, see right off the bat the hierarchical scale. With this is Narmer, and you have that hierarchical scale. As you can see, he's much, much larger than anyone else on it at all. Here are the registers. So the the central register is significantly larger, whereas the standard of Ur we saw right that they were all the same um, size you do have significant difference in size with the central larger one focusing on the, the, the pharaoh himself. Um, and he has a mace and he's, he's attacking or killing uh, uh, the enemy. You have, um, this is the god Horus, who was often represented as a falcon. Um, and, and then you have bulls which were connected to uh, not only the gods, but power. And then of course you see the power in, in him conquering foes. And then you have him always behind him is a support system essentially. You have a, a scribe in one and a priest in another. So there's one side. Um, and and this, this, one, this one actually does a, a, a good job of comparing um, the Nar the palette of Naram Sin, uh, and, uh, the palette of Narmer, right? Cause we talked about that hierarchical scale here and how this was unusual for Mesopotamia, but, it, uh, showcases that conquest as well. But even between this, the, the, pal the, the stella of Naram Sin and, um, the, the palette of Narmer, Right, Narmer is so much larger. Narmer Sin is, is far larger than what most Mesopotamian art showcased. But compared even to Egypt, right, there's a significant difference in um, that hierarchical scale that was used. And, and that was very much connected to the pharaohs. Um, so that's that we looked at with this side here. The other side, you see, again has the registers. Um, and we have now the pharaoh not quite as large. 
One of the other things to notice about this is he's got two different crowns or helmets on. Uh, and we'll, we'll take a look at that in a minute. That there's, because one is the crown of Upper Egypt and one is the crown of Lower Egypt. And it shows him conquering um, as, as king of both. Here he is. Uh, uh, he's followed by uh, the priest. Uh, um, or right here is the priest. And then you have one behind him too. And then you have um, the enemy soldiers that are dead and then in uh the register you also have these mythical creatures that have these long necks that are intertwining this is sometimes the idea um that it's connected to um the connection between both kingdoms so while you still have the hierarchical scale, it is smaller uh, than the other side we looked at where he's massive and the central focus to that. And here you can see again being the scribe and then the priest uh, with the procession of the gods. Uh, and then which is cut out of this, of course, other than the enemies. And then a bull um at the bottom register again stepping on this person the helmets uh or crowns really they look kind of like helmets but they're crowns um you had um the crown of lower egypt here and and narmer on the palette is wearing both right he wears the crown of upper egypt and one and the crown of lower egypt and the other once egypt was unified then they combine the two crowns together. Um, and they had a whole ceremony for this. There, these, this was carved into um, pyramids and tombs. Um, it was, uh, headgear was um, both crowns and other um, things that they wore were not only political statements for showcasing their power and authority, um, but also were uh, works of art uh, in itself for the design and structure here you have um this uh traditional royal uh headdress and beard they would wear a fake beard uh, and then you had the headdress here um, and this this cloth headdress uh, this is what was often uh, what they would wear for portraits for formal um, uh, meetings, uh, meeting dignitaries and stuff like that. And that was also very much to highlight power and authority as well. So let's look at, um, the, the role of the Pharaoh, uh, because this is, uh, central to a lot of the art and architecture in Egypt. Um, the, we saw, so we looked at the, uh, crowns and headgear and the importance of, um, what propaganda that it, it definitely was art for propaganda to showcase power and authority with the Pharaoh. Now the belief with the Pharaoh was that the Pharaoh had two bodies. One, uh, was the human side. And then, uh, the other was the divine side. Now the misconception that is often, uh, written down is that, that the Egyptians believed that the Pharaoh was a God and that's, it's, it's not exactly the case. And it's, it, it may seem like nitpicking here how I'm going to explain what it really was, but it, it's very important to that distinction. And um, it makes a whole lot more sense why they were so focused on um, the afterlife, right? If we looked at one of our themes and I mentioned that this was going to be a big one, the afterlife is central to a lot of um, Egyptian art. And this is the reason why and the architecture. Um, and, and so if you just immediately say that the Pharaoh is a God, it takes out the purpose for the, why there's so much focus on the afterlife in art and architecture. Um, but when you look at it this way, it makes a whole lot more sense. So you have two sides with this, then the coronation of the Pharaoh, um, 
which is where he's crowned, right? So when the, the Pharaoh, before the Pharaoh is crowned, he just has his human side, right? When the coronation happens, the divine side is, I don't know what, activated essentially. And then he becomes in a state of becoming divine. So the best way to think of it is that the Pharaoh is, is maybe semi-divine, partially divine, um, but he's in a state of becoming divine. It is death that leads to divinity, right? So with the Pharaoh's death, he then fully becomes, you know, a God essentially, and part of the, of the gods. Thus, because it's his death that is that final transformation, there is constant focus on death and the afterlife in Egyptian society and art. And we see this um, with um, the pyramids uh, and the art in the pyramids. Um, and then uh, we mentioned with the, the role of the Pharaoh, it also explains the emphasis on hierarchical scale because the Pharaoh is partially divine. I would explain it if he was fully divine as well, but he's, he is still more than just a regular human. Um, and because he is semi divine or in the state of becoming divine, right, then you're going to have that larger hierarchical scale because, um, he's, you know, he's more than just human. The pyramids then um, are going to contain both the architecture and um, the art behind it. There were three stages uh, for um, the pyramids. The first was the mastaba, which is actually a tomb, and initially pharaohs were buried in mastabas. Um, the mastaba, and I will have, we'll look at the pictures in just a minute, but the mastaba, if this is the ground, the mastaba was just like this, right? So that this is the mastaba. And then you had uh, underneath the burial chamber underground, right? The um, next step was step pyramids you had a, a architect uh, named Imhotep who was tasked with uh, taking the mastaba and making something better for the Pharaoh. And so what he did is the step pyramid is essentially just several mastabas stacked on top of each other, right? And, and then you still had the, the burial chamber and it was more complex than one room but it gets you the idea here so there's the ground and then it was mastabas stacked on top of each other and then from there right it should uh not be hard to see how you get to pyramids which is just really smoothing out the mastaba the step pyramid uh, into a, a, a more smooth transition with the stone. And then of course the underground, uh, chambers as well. The Pharaohs, the, the pyramids were very much, uh, a symbol, right? See, this is with the architecture. It was, uh, I mean, the whole purpose of the pyramid was for the afterlife. Um, so we'll say in themes. The, as soon as the Pharaoh was crowned, they began work on the pyramids and it would usually take, uh, 20 to 30 years to build. Um, and was super important for, uh, the Pharaoh because when he died, right, this is, it's where he was uh, placed and he needed this to get to the afterlife. And you wanted the Pharaoh to get to the afterlife because when he died, then he became divine. Um, it, it also uh, was a, a connection to power and authority. 
but we'll come back to that in just a second, right? This, the, the, they're building a pyramid for most of the Pharaoh's rule. As soon as he's crowned, they get to work on it. Um, and, and for most of his reign, this pyramid is being built and, and that's not just the outside, but then we'll see the art and everything else that goes into it. It was a central key component of that. Um, and, and so you have all of that architecture and art being depicted around his death um, because it was central to uh, becoming divine. Um, and there were, the, the belief was that you needed incantations and spells in order to get to the afterlife. So the uh, pyramid text was on uh, the wall so that the pharaoh's uh, ba or ka, which uh, was the spirit, could read the incantations and spells to get to the afterlife. Everything that was put in the pyramid, um, which would be their, their favorite objects in life, um, which could be chairs, games, um, their favorite pets were mummified, um, family members were mummified and um, put in. Now the, the uh, book does mention that they were killed, but that's not what happened in, in most of Egypt. Instead, when the uh, um, wife of the Pharaoh died, even if it was after his death, right, she continued to live until she died. And once she died, she was then mummified and then put in um, the pyramid either through another entrance or occasionally um, a, a smaller pyramid right next to the pharaohs would be put in um, for that. Um, and then anything that was going to rot or couldn't last like food um, and servants or, or that you weren't going to kill to put in or, or daily life activities, those would be put into the paintings because the incantations and spells could bring a spiritual representation of those to the afterlife. And the importance of the afterlife um, was that the belief that the afterlife was a continuation of the current world. Now this changes with the shift in Mott. So, and this was the old kingdom. In the Middle Kingdom, it shifts to the afterlife is a continuation um, of the Old Kingdom uh, world because the Old Kingdom was seen as the ideal uh, kingdom. And then in the New Kingdom, um, it becomes a moral um, uh, obligation. It's still a continuation of the Old Kingdom though. Um, and, and so this had to do with, of course, the tr change in view in Mott um, and that the world wasn't as good as it used to be. The world was at its best when Mott was present. And so that was the old kingdom. So you would you had all the all of the stuff that went into the pyramid. And we'll look at some of that and all of the art and all of the things connected to it were all things that the Pharaoh needed to take with him into the afterlife. And it was either the, the if it was actually present, that was the better option. But if um, you couldn't, because either, you, you know, uh, your wife was not dead yet, you would have statues and reliefs and images of her and your children and your servants and things like that, along with food and animals that would just rot and wouldn't survive the process. This is why mummification happened as well, to preserve the body for the Pharaoh to get into the afterlife. Um, and so all of that was centered around that concept. And then of course it's directly connected to the gods as well because the gods are represented in the, um, the whole process, both the pyramid as a, a vehicle to get to the afterlife with the gods and then the images of the gods proceeding over the various uh, incantations and spells for you to do so. Now power and authority um, is kind of like the bigger the better uh, it was, was part of that visual representation of the Pharaoh's power. And so in the old kingdom, uh, each subsequent Pharaoh um, tried to make their uh, pyramid larger. And they did uh, until at one point, uh, one Pharaoh, so here, this, this was the mistake 
one pharaoh uh, pyramid, the architect screwed up, and as they were going along, they realized that it would collapse if they kept going, so they had to go in and then make this little weird uh, point at the top, uh, and then, that is not equal here, and then, on my drawing, and then uh, go over. I apparently can't draw the equal side here on that. There, that looks a little better. Uh, yeah, I'm sure that architect was fired, if not worse. Uh, after this failure uh, with this pyramid, which was all done in an attempt to, you know, be bigger, they stopped trying to make them larger. There'll be some economic stuff in the Middle Kingdom where they, they just can't finance larger pyramids anymore. But in the Old Kingdom, there was a, oh, we've reached the limit of our architectural ability to make it any larger. And this pharaoh's uh, pyramid was the physical reminder of that, which was the opposite of what it was supposed to do, which large pyramids showcased power, wealth, and authority just by the physical presence. I mean, they didn't have to make them that large to hold and store because the reality is, is right in the pyramids, most of the storage of stuff, all of the storage of stuff was underground, uh, or at least uh, near the uh, bottom of the pyramid and then underground. So the, the extra size was very much for prestige and power and authority. That was a physical reminder to everyone else in the kingdom for how powerful that Pharaoh was. And if you had a larger pyramid, so it was, you know, so, so it was. So propaganda did play a role in their architecture. Um, but it also, the, the main purpose was still, again, uh, to provide that afterlife um, with the gods uh, for the Pharaoh. So let's take a look at um, some of these examples. We're going to come back to these poses uh, here or there. I know they're first, um, but I'm going to, I'm going to come back to them. So you have here is uh, the must, one of the mastabas, which is a tomb. Uh, again, you just have the, the one level and most of the actual um, building uh, of where things were stored was underground. Now in the one level you had, uh, you can see this, this hole here in the roof. Um, you had this entryway, um, visitors, it's hard to see on the picture itself, visitors, uh, uh location or, um, entrance so that, uh, people could go and pay their respects to, um, that, that Pharaoh. And then in here in that central one with the and actually a roof, you would have, um, uh, reliefs and text and image for the incantations and spells. And then the body, uh, was underground. Uh, and so that, uh, uh, was the main characteristics of the Mastaba. The next one here we see is the, the, the step pyramid. Again, Emotep was the architect who, um, did this and, uh, they, they showcase Emotep. If you ever watched the mummy with, uh, Brendan Fraser, um, you have, they have Emotep in there, uh, right. And then the misconception is that the book of the dead with those, incant which are just the incantations and spells from the pyramids um, uh, brought the physical mummy back to being body back to life, which is not, it brought the, the ba or the ka, the spirit to life in the afterlife. Um, but it's a much more interesting, uh, or not translation, but, uh, interpretation, right? That it's, that these incantations and spells are bringing an actual body back to life. The, the mummy, the movie, um, they put Emotep in like the new kingdom. He was at the beginning of the old kingdom. So you can see the, the ridges here with the mastabas, right? Uh, each one of these was a mastaba stacked on top of each other. And that's what gets you your step pyramid. And then, uh, this is a good diagram to showcase um, the inner workings of these. So in the mastaba, you can see the under, uh, the shafts and, um, underground areas, uh, versus my, I just did a, a generic rectangle for each in my drawing. And then you have, um, the step pyramids, which has, and it, this is nice. It showcases what the size of the mastabas often were compared to the step pyramid, which is what Emotep was asked to do make my, my burial, uh, 
tomb or or whatever chambers larger than everyone else's and so it was significantly larger than the mastaba uh, and that was done purely for showcasing power and then you have the underground shafts and then burial chamber in the pyramid and the the only thing with this view is it makes it look like it goes all the way up to the top and while uh, a few of the great pyramids um, uh, did go about halfway it was usually halfway and under um, for use of the pyramid. And then this top part was, didn't have, uh, much, um, other than maybe some breathing shafts, um, because they did, as the workers were building this, they had to actually cut actual air shafts into the pyramid. So they didn't suffocate as they were building these really, uh, long chambers. There were not, um, traps, um, where, uh, you went into the pyramid and I don't know, trap doors and spikes swinging out. But if you can see that this is a good example of this, these shafts here were super long and super steep. And then the burial chamber was down here underground again. The point was to make it difficult that if you did have grave robbers, it would be really hard to get, um, to the body. Um, and, and imagine like if you fell, you would die if you fell down these, it was, this was a super long, super steep, uh, shafts to get into the, where the wealth and, and a lot of the, the goods were. You also could have burial chambers for wives and, and family members up here. Um, uh, they also sometimes, instead of making it down below, um, would make, a, a secret, uh, little, entryway that was up at the top of the wall. So if here was a wall in the pyramid and here's the floor, uh, right where normally floors are at the very top of the wall would be this small chamber that was just big enough to squeeze through. And that actually went back into the burial chamber. Uh, and the whole point was, is that it, it wasn't uh, noticeable, especially if you're thinking if someone was actually grave robbing, they didn't have a ton of light to see. Um, so it, they did their, their only traps were to make it extremely difficult to get to the body, um, rather than, um, uh, you know, things that killed you. Uh, that definitely was just part of Hollywood, uh, and, and stories later on. Now in the new kingdom, you have the Valley of the Kings. The pyramids only last through, um, the old and middle kingdom. And so you do have the Valley of the Kings, which shifts back to a secret place with tombs because they don't have the wealth and they're, they're trying to hide it from grave robbers. And the Val in the Valley of the Kings, the tombs there, um, were, um, did have curses attached to them. Now, again, not trap doors and tricks that way, but they, um, they did have curses on the entry doorway, um, that said, if you disturbed or, uh, if you disturbed with nefarious purposes, uh, then that, uh, you would be cursed. So it wasn't even a, a disruption um, with the regular getting into the, the tomb, but rather if you had nefarious purposes for grave, uh, robbers, right? That, that was who the curse was for. And so, um, some of the idea of, um, these trap doors and, and tricks in pyramids probably came from the curses which they read on the tombs, uh, with the finding of King Tut's tomb and things like that. And then that's where you get the, the myth and legend that gets exaggerated, uh, over time. So the Valley of the Kings, it was secret back to tombs and you do have, uh, some curses on the doors, but again, that was it. And this had to do with, of course, uh, economic issues and not having enough money and, and people being more desperate because society was not as well off in the new kingdom. And so people were more willing to steal and steal from the Pharaoh's tombs, which were like a big no, no in Egyptian society to mess with the, the Pharaoh's burial, right? He's supposed to, he's going to become divine. You don't mess with the gods that way. Uh, and so here you have, um, 
the the tombs and uh, the sorry the pyramids and this is a good picture the great pyramids of giza of you have modern day uh, uh buildings in the background and it showcases just uh the size of these pyramids and how massive they were um, and again that was intentional to showcase the power and authority of the pharaohs now in the um uh let's see i think we're on six here with the pyramids you don't see it now um because that has been long uh, weathered away or stolen um, they actually were covered in uh, limestone powder which made them have a, a, a white kind of sheen to it there we go and also uh, a gold plated tip so if you look here you can kind of see a little bit of the limestone remnants at the very top of the central pyramid um, the whole thing would have been covered these are actually not step pyramids uh, they uh, have been the outer layers have been removed and that's just over the ages uh, people took them after after the fall of the new kingdom various people who controlled Egypt and others, they, they uh, took the outer stones because they were valuable. And then at the very tip, you could have on some of them a gold uh, plated uh, area as well. So it would have actually, with the sun hitting it, this thing would have been reflective, uh, which just makes it give off more of this divine godly sense and brilliance to it, which also reinforced that image and, and view. And then uh, here with the slide, the layout of the Giza Plaza, uh, it just shows you um, oh, the different um, mastabas that they had um, and some of the temples. So uh, you had the main pyramids of the kings, um, but then uh, certain loyal viziers, which were kind of like right hand men to the king, um, to the pharaoh, they could get mastabas, which would give you an afterlife. In order to get an afterlife, you had to have a pyramid or tomb. Uh, the average Egyptian didn't have an afterlife. So what's even more crazy with how much this is focused on the Pharaoh um, is that all of this emphasis on the afterlife and that a theme in art was all for the Pharaoh and his family. In the old kingdom, they were the ones that had an afterlife. Um, and then in the new, um, in the middle kingdom, uh, you could get an afterlife if you got a coffin text that had the incantations and spells in them. But again, if without those incantations and spells, you could not get an afterlife. So granting a vizier a tomb guaranteed him an afterlife. In the new kingdom, then it became a moral component and anyone um, uh, that passed the moral component. Although by the end of the middle kingdom, it was on papyrus text. So as long as you could afford a really cheap paper, you could get a basic bare minimum afterlife. Um, but, but definitely, and like I said, the old kingdom where you have this, such a central focus on, on the afterlife and the pyramids and death, it was for the Pharaoh and his family, not for the average Egyptian citizen. And so it, it just shows you how much of Egypt was centered around the Pharaoh and his power, um, because he was in a state of becoming divine and the Pharaoh did control and, uh, and basically own Egypt in that sense. Um, so what I want to look at next is uh, the um, poses uh, and tomb and pyramid paintings and all that went around that. Um, pause for a second while this unfreezes. All right, it unstuck there. So the next uh, one that we're looking at then are the tomb uh, pyramid uh, paintings. And with that also poses in human proportion. So I want to look at that first, um, the poses and um, human proportion. So the, um, the way that this was done is that the priests were the artist. And priests trained um, for uh, their, most of their life 
to be able to draw and carve the tomb and pyramid. I'll just, we'll stick with pyramid here. Um, but it's for both the pyramid uh, images and text, both which worked, uh, that worked together. Um, because of this, they wanted it um, unified so that you could not tell uh, different artists, tell different uh, priests, right? It was meant to look um, all the same. That was the goal, that it was all the same. Uh, and consequently, uh, you had a series of, and, and, and also the, the idea of the, the focus wasn't on the artist or realism. Um, that, that was not the purpose. It, the purpose uh, was for uh, the afterlife and religion. And consequently, you have um, a series of rules for um, both poses and um, also proportion of the of uh, of the human um, body, and that way it uh, it didn't matter who did it or who started on it and who picked up from it, um, it, it would produce the same consistent results each time. Um, and the poses were connected to the rituals and incantations. So you have here, we go back, uh, some examples of poses. Um, worshiping, presenting offering, ready to receive offering, summoning, protecting, rejoicing, praising, mourning. And these were done for consistency to say that this pose means worshiping, this pose means ready to receive offerings, this is rejoicing. But if you notice, again, they're all connected to religion. They're poses based on, um, Religion for the gods mourning uh, could be just for for the death But but summoning ready to receive offerings presenting offering worshiping protecting rejoicing praising are all connected to uh, The religious idea and the gods Which was one of the other themes and by setting up these this pose means this um, They could communicate these ideas Consistently the same every time so there was no confusion of what uh, was supposed to be happening in each image because that was important for the Pharaoh to be able to um, uh, be able to read and interpret and understand in order to get to the afterlife. For human proportion, they set up this grid and it was done specifically again so that every time they created um, a, a drawing or carving of, of the Pharaoh or a god um, or, or anyone else that it was consistent and anyone could pick up and continue uh, creating that um, and it wouldn't and because you had you had to have this again this was a 20 to 30 year project not only for building the pyramids but for all of the images the art the text um, the, the reliefs um, that, that went into this, um, it, it took a long time. So you had hundreds of priests that worked on this um, and, and that they would do different areas, but the idea was to create a seamless look throughout uh, because the focus wasn't on realism, but this idealized uh, depiction of the human figure. Now, um, idealized um, depiction idealization right the ideal form of uh, the human body does not mean it has to be accurate we'll see when we look at the Greeks they're going to have their own idealization and their goal is to create an idealized but realistic potentially realistic view of the human body. It's basically like what your body would look like in the best tip-top shape at a younger, like, you know, early 20s age. 
it is possible to look like that. Most people don't, but it is possible. Um, and, and they, it was an emphasis on realism and showing muscles, the correct muscles, veins, all of that in Egypt, that didn't matter. Um, so idealization does not have to mean accurate in terms of, of showcasing the human body, just the idealized form that they want to, uh, showcase. Um, and this was done in, um, paintings and reliefs and statues. So you have paintings, reliefs, right? And then the statues or, you know, in the round as we, uh, discussed it, all of these, uh, uh, kept the same, um, proportions, idealized proportions that were done. They used a grid like structure, which they actually, um, it's not grid like it is a grid structure. They used a grid structure, which they, um, put on the wall itself, uh, to actually measure the proportions. Right. And then that way, um, there wasn't any difference between one person and another. And, and so with this slide, you can see the, uh, the breakdown of the measurements of both the full grid, uh, into individual scare, uh, squares so that you could piece by piece, create the same standardized method. And if we go back here, right, that, that standardization is a key aspect of what they were trying to do. Uh, and then you also have these cubits, uh, which was their form of measurement that broke, uh, into thirds, uh, and, and that then allowed you to, uh, uh section off the body in thirds for those individual measurements. And then, uh, the, the shoulders to hip ratio was, uh, very uniquely Egyptian, uh, as well as the stance. So you can see, um, I don't need the battery life right now. Go away. <laughs> um, you can see the stance here, um, is always, there's two parts to it. Um, one is the sideways aspect where you have the, uh, legs and feet facing sideways from, um, that, um, angle. And then the torso and shoulders are front facing. And then the head goes back to the side. This, you can't actually stand exactly like this. Again, it's not realistic. Now statues did have a front facing one with the hands down right at your, um, your legs and kind of clenched in fist. Um, and so you did have that position as well. There were like two main positions, uh, besides the poses we saw of worshiping or praising and stuff like that or sitting. But in terms of, of a, either the, the one would be, uh, a fully front or this one that was a mix of front side, front side. Um, and, and so that was, uh, very much unique to Egypt. And then that the shoulders were always much wider than the hips. Uh, and again, in a non natural way. Um, and it was more rigid in nature. Um, and again, that was intentional, um, because you were creating these standardized poses, um, that could be easily replicated uh, over and over again by, uh, lots of different artists. And then we can see in the, um, next slide, the Egyptian sculptural relief, where you can see the remnants of, of, uh, reliefs that were on, uh, our car, these were carvings. This one was carved in. Sometimes they did reliefs. This one was actually carved in of where you have an unfinished carving. Um, and you can see the grid structure that they had lightly put on in order to draw the outline of the body. And then you can see where they started to carve in and then they would paint, uh, into those, uh, uh, indented recesses, um, in it. Now, most of the, um, pyramid text, uh, went hand in hand 
with the paintings and carvings. And we'll, we'll look at that in just a second. Um, so that, that those poses, that idealization, the proportions that was all set up in a, a very specific way. And apparently my computer is freezing a lot, which makes it seem oh so secure for this not crashing. Uh, I, I will have to again wait here for a second to let me move on. We're going to look at next are the hieroglyphs and the actual art and um, what those were um, showcasing. So the hieroglyphs um, were the, the writing and we looked at the development of Mesopotamian writing with cuneiform writing. Um, and now we're going to, uh, there we go. That took way too long there. Um, we're going to look at, at Egyptian writing. Um, and specifically though, just one aspect of it, which was, um, that more artistic structure. So much like Mesopotamia, they had, um, uh, they had two phases, uh, but they keep both of theirs, right? So you have the pictograph phase, which were what we call for Egyptian writing, the hieroglyphs. Um, and, but the hieroglyphs are pictographs. And then you have the, uh, script writing, which was the syllabic, the, uh, script writing they used for, um, day-to-day -day stuff. If you were going to write a letter, if you were recording, you know, economic information, the hieroglyphs were used for religion, uh, religious purposes. So, uh, that would include, right, the pyramids and for important ceremonies. Um, so whereas Mesopotamia, um, stopped using the pictographs, um, Egypt never does, but it, uh, hieroglyphs were not what people wrote in, um, on a day-to-day -day, day -day basis. Like the priests learned the hieroglyphs uh, and it was an art form um, to be able to uh, have a more artistic uh, aspect to um, the, the pyramids and again, ceremonies. So the hieroglyphs were almost always connected with the Pharaoh you rarely had uh, hieroglyphs that show, were, were around if, if it was not, uh, again, an important ceremony that was connected to the Pharaoh or the pyramids. Uh, I have a couple images here of um, just, well, this one's just a chart that shows how the different hieroglyphs represent different things, right? So you have man, woman, ankh, uh, feather, vulture, owl, right? So that's the pictograph, the one-to-one -one ratio where an image represents an idea. It later gets connected to the alphabet, uh, for, for, uh, English translation, uh, to, which works to a degree, uh, not, not completely. Um, but it, it, it does, um, partially now writing, um, the hieroglyphs were the incantations and spells that were needed for the Pharaoh. So they were connected to the art because you would have, um, the image or picture of uh, a variety of things, um, that the Pharaoh wanted to take to the afterlife. Um, and then the incantations and spells would be the words you needed to say in order to get that uh, to, to the afterlife. So, um, what the art, uh, showcased in the pyramids, uh, were several things. Um, obviously first you have that they showcase just as we mentioned above, but I'll put them with, with, um, with both there is the hieroglyphs, which were those, what we just said, the incantations and spells that were expected to be said by the Pharaoh's Ba, then you always had, uh, images of the Pharaoh and his family. Um, then you had, uh, rituals with the gods, right? Because the, 
idea was is the pharaoh was becoming divine and so you had this process to interact with the gods in order to get to the afterlife and then you had scenes of daily life and this was um, a, a significant aspect of the art in the pyramids uh, and why daily life and I, I mentioned this uh, briefly before was because the afterlife was that continuation of current or old kingdom world so the pharaoh uh, if you're going to your afterlife is going to be a continuation of the current life you want your stuff with you right if you want you want to have a, a good life <laughs> Uh, in your afterlife, you're not going to go with nothing. That would kind of uh, suck in terms of, well, I'm here in the afterlife and I've got nothing with me. Guess I'll sit here. Uh, so you wanted your stuff with you. And, the, and this included anything possible. Of course, it was family. Now, the, the physical was better. But art could create a, a spiritual representation so this is why you have all these scenes is if you can't bring the physical with you then you have the depictions of it um so they would put as much stuff as they possibly could in the pyramids itself and then the rest would would get into art and sometimes you would double up on it so you might actually have a physical representation in the pyramid but you would also have a picture with incantations and spells in case something happened to the physical it was like a um a, a backup in case uh, one wasn't present then it's still guaranteed that you got to take this stuff to um uh, the afterlife with you um so things that they they showcased in these um uh, art, the artwork was family, um, food, animals, uh, scenes of hunting, because of course you don't want to get to the afterlife and not be able to hunt, uh, beer and wine, as well as the whole process of making it. So uh, again, uh, you know, you don't want to get to the afterlife um, without your, your drink. Uh, to enjoy yourself, games, um, pets, right, and and the the list could go on. Um, the t the top ones were definitely family, food, animals, um, and you put beer and wine under food, I suppose, um, and and general a activities, right? All of these other ones, the games, um, hunting favorite things and it, it was somewhat individual to um the pharaoh there were uh the ones i i asterisks were generally in most of the pyramids but um it was part of what the pharaoh enjoyed doing what they wanted in the afterlife um and then you kind of had like your uh, essentials right so so the the asterisks were the essentials and then everything else could vary slightly depending on, you know, what the Pharaoh wanted in that process. And all of this art fit within those idealized proportions and the poses um, that coincided with the hieroglyphs um, that were essential. Like both of these, the art and the hieroglyphs worked together. You, you didn't want them separate because it, no, it did you no good to have a, an image um, if you couldn't say the incantations and spells to actually get it to um, showcase um, the process. Um, so you had, here is one, oh, go back. Here we have uh, one that shows the daily scenes um, and, and you can see the different poses um that are are taking place some of it is in this one they're hunting um, but here there uh you have the people sitting down in the receiving of uh and right so on the the top left well on the very top right you have a design and then um let's see if it'll let me draw on this i think so on the so on the top perfect you have just a design 
Um, and then you have the hieroglyphs he uh, here. And these would be the incantations and spells. If you ever see um, the, uh, um, the cartouche, oh, it's going to go off of it. Here, I'll draw it on here for just a second. Over here, this isn't taking up too much. This is a, a cartouche. It's like a, what an oval with a line on the bottom. This is a, a name, right? So that is, is, is giving you the name of the king or someone else. Um, and that, that's an easy identifier if you're looking through the text. And so obviously you're not going to be able to read the hieroglyphs, but you can pick out when there's someone's name that they're, they're writing about. And that could be a god, that could be the pharaoh. So the, the, the uh, pr receiving through sitting down here um, in the chair, and then what's being given to them are these different foodstuffs um, for the journey, right? And you have bread, you have grain. Um, it looks like there are some baskets with food as well. Um, and then in the next scene over on the right, you have, uh, ducks, um, and other birds, uh, fit and fish and they're hunting in the reeds, right? You have the reeds and the Nile right here. Again, the importance of the Nile shows up in a lot of the art. Um, and, and they're hunting. And then here at the bottom left, they're again receiving more food. Then you have um, both uh, the birds that have been collected from the hunt as well as grain and harvest. Uh, so farming and agriculture to have sustained. Here you have with the pots, the beer. Um, and then picking uh, grapes for the wine, so probably wine, uh, the wine or grain um, or beer process, right? So that those were scenes from daily life, but also essentials for the different food production that you would want to have in the afterlife. Then we have this one here, um, which uh, shows rituals and processions. Now, this is a, a new kingdom um one and um that's because of the specific um no it's not gonna let me write on anything but the drawing itself so this is new kingdom um and the it's new kingdom because it changes the religious belief from i mentioned that there was a moral obligation in the new kingdom in the old and middle kingdom um, to get to the afterlife, you just needed the incantations and spells. In the New Kingdom, uh, you get um, the... Um, here, we'll do with the rituals to the gods. You had what was called the negative confessions. And this, again, was put in K for New Kingdom. Um, and this was because Mott was lost in the present world, it had moved to religion and a moral obligation. In the Old and Middle Kingdom, you could just um, have the incantations and spells and you could technically have been a horrible person and you'd still get an afterlife if you had those incantations. In the New Kingdom, um, y if you are not a good person, you were not likely to get an afterlife. So the negative confessions, why they're called that is because it was, I have not, I have not, I have not. And so you have the hieroglyphs here that are, are showcasing the negative confessions. I have not done this. I have not hurt someone. I have not hired an assassin, which was one of the negative confessions because apparently there were problems with people hiring assassins. Assassins. I have not stolen. I have not stolen from the temples. I have not forsaken the gods. I have not done this, that, that. And the idea was, is uh, you were, then your ba or ka would say the negative confessions while this ritual was taking place. And here you have the person being led um, by the, the god. Um, and you, uh, right next to it is a scale. And the scale has this jar where your heart would be placed. And again, this is just uh, in the belief in the procession in the, um, the realm of the gods, essentially, right? They didn't actually weigh someone's heart. Um, but the idea was, is that when they buried you in the new kingdom, your family members would say the negative confessions as well as a safeguard in case something happened with your, uh, with you not being able to say it when this procession was happening. So you're supposed to be listing off the negative confessions while on the scale, they weigh your heart 
here, which is what the jar represents, against this feather, which was the feather of Mott. And if you were weighed uh, worthy, so equal, or I suppose maybe you could weigh better, but it was the idea that you equalized, your heart was equal to Mott. And remember, Mott, justice, harmony, balance, um, truth. That, that's Mott, right? So you were supposed to follow Mott in your life in order to get an afterlife. If you failed, if your heart did not measure up to Mott, to that feather of Mott, this crocodile-like dog uh, here would um, eat you and then you would cease to exist. If you passed, right, which this person does, then you move on to get to have an afterlife. So this was an important thing in pyramids and tombs in the New Kingdom. They had other rituals and processes with the gods in the Old and Middle Kingdom. This one is just very much a, a New Kingdom one because it was connected to that moral obligation to get into the afterlife. Um, and so these were ones that you often saw within, um, the, like I said, the tombs. If it wasn't the, the feather of Mott being weighed with your heart, then it were other ones where you gave uh, offerings and praise to the gods uh, for your transition to the afterlife. And again, the what was also different is with the New Kingdom, anyone could get an afterlife if they uh, uh, were moral enough, right? In the Old Kingdom, it was the Pharaoh and his family getting an afterlife. So you do see some change in depiction in the New Kingdom of not having that hierarchical scale for two reasons. Well, one here, it's the person and the gods, so they're, they're going to be of that size. But you also see in the New Kingdom uh, less hierarchical scale, um, unless it's the Pharaoh. But, but that's because you had some pyramids and tombs that people were not pharaohs um, and they could still get an afterlife. Um, so let's put those uh, back down. Um, and then uh, just, you know, the, the whole process of even the coffins um, were uh, uh, an artistic component, at least the, the interior. Um, just, let's see where we have five here. Uh, so the carf the coffins and the sarcophagus, um, you had several layers usually of, of coffins for the burial chamber. The body was always put in the burial chamber. And then you would have, uh, we'll just call it layers, uh, usually made out of, of stone. The outer layers were often bland. They were meant to not attract attention. The, the final layer with the sarcophagus uh, was a uh, human size and shape and often very elaborate and uh, with gold. Uh, and that was meant to present the body because that was the final uh, coffin uh, before the body. And then of course you had um, the mummification process was the important step in um, preserving the body for uh, the afterlife. Because again, remember physical um, is better. And, and they had a whole process for this. Um, the whole point of the canopic jars was to preserve as much of the, the body as, as possible. It took several months uh, to finish this, which is why it, it was only for the pharaohs and the family. Um, you know, average people didn't get mummified. Uh, later, by the New Kingdoms, really wealthy people could get mummified uh, if you were willing to pay for it, but it was a very expensive process. The average Egyptian didn't get mummified. It, it was reserved again for that power for the pharaohs and, and the, their family. The heart was actually left in the body because the heart was believed to be essentially the brain. They called it the, um, <clears throat> the organ of thought and it was seen as the most important thing that was uh, necessary the brain they actually thought was not important and they um, got rid of it. It was removed uh, and, and thrown out. Uh, it was removed, they would take um, this kind of long, slightly hooked stick thing and uh, 
that was a very pointy nose. If here is the nose, right, they would, it would go up the nose into the brain part and they would move it up and down until you had made the brain into mush and then you would pull it back through uh, the nose. And um, that uh, was the uh, process of removing the brain. And again, it was just, it was seen as, as an unimportant uh, organ. And then the liver, um, the lungs, the intestines, and the stomach, so there were four total, were put into canopic jars. And these canopic jars uh, were, they could be simple or elaborate, but they kind of looked like this with the lid. Uh, and you had four of them that were placed near where um, the body was, and they were preserved. Um, as, as organs that were not as important as the heart, but still be important to have nearby. Then the body was soaked in salt um, and other um, preservatives. And that process um, took uh, uh, a month or so. Um, sometimes a little bit longer and then they were wrapped the body was wrapped in linen and this preserved the body uh, and then it was put into the coffin after um, that and we have here if we look here you can see oh here's here's one more of uh, scenes of daily life again you have the hierarchical scale um, and then uh, those in the boats with the fish in the Nile hunting it's a hunting scene and there's a hunting with a pharaoh, uh, thus the hierarchical scale, right? It's easy to tell when there's a pharaoh. You can't read that there, so I'll take that off. It's easy to tell when it's a pharaoh um, because, uh, or a god, but most of them, the, the gods, they don't showcase as much as the pharaohs. Um, and then you have animals up in here in the reeds too. Um, so if we look at, um, here, here is the sarcophagus. This is of King Tut. Um, and this was the final um, part of the coffin, right? So this sarcophagus, which was inlaid in gold and, and used and showcased the headdress, the fake beard, um, and the artwork of, of well, a design for what was meant to showcase, again, power and authority, of the Pharaoh, even in death, um, because of that semi-divine status, this, which was just larger than the body itself, was then put in uh, to the, the other coffins. Now, inside this coffin, you actually had um, the um, head um, ma death mask. So this here is the death mask, um, and this just went over um, the head and then the body with the linens, and then that all went into the, uh, the, the I guess, last coffin or sarcophagus, right? And then you had a layer of coffins after that. Now, uh, the, sar the sarcophagus could be just, um, and these were the ones with stone. Sometimes it was just one, so you'd have these three stages, the body, the death mask, the the um, the coffin that looked like a, their body, and then the stone coffin. Uh, sometimes you had another larger stone coffin on top of that, and and that was all for protection of the the pharaoh's body itself. Um, okay, so that's that's the um, coffin pyra or the pyramid text um, and the art. Um, that was uh, set up with the writing and again the importance of that they went together in that process. Um, so now we're going to look at um, uh, statues, temples, um, and pyramids. Well more of the, we already looked at the pyramids but they go together. All three of these often had uh, similar uh, purposes and stuff. So with the um, statues, and, and even, uh, um, well, so for of people, you had uh, basically a process that was either 
uh, idealization or uh, uh, naturalism. And it depended on um, the subject. So if it was for the pharaoh, it was almost always that idealization um, and the hierarchical scale. Even in statues, the pharaohs were really large. Um, and then sometimes even like their wives would be really small by their feet. Um, and, and that was, again, the overemphasis of a hierarchical scale. Um, the idealization was those proportions. Now, some normal people could have the idealization because, again, it, it wasn't just this meant to be this perfect form, but rather it was the um, process and structure, right? When you're looking at idealization, it's a, a process and structure to create standardization. But it also doesn't, it's not realistic. It's not um, meant to show, right, no flaws. Part of that, even though it's not accurate and realistic in terms of showcasing, like, the best body ever, they don't showcase flaws because that doesn't fit with the standardization and process. Uh, the other than naturalism uh, was, uh, for, uh, more often than not normal people and daily life. When they wanted to showcase someone that wasn't a God or, um, a Pharaoh, then you showed, uh, naturalism and this tended to be more realistic. Uh, and so you would see scenes and poses that did not, uh, that uh, did not follow those, um, the rules. Now, this method, the naturalization, until the New Kingdom was less common. Um, they, you do have, um, statues and, 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 um, almost no drawings, but you do have some statues of people that showcases, so here's one that shows the idealism and, uh, and the, um, specific structure. You have the, um, this is the front facing one, by the way, we looked at the one that had front side front, uh, or side, sorry, side, side, front, side, uh, in depiction. And then you have one that's all front facing. Again, the legs are still one foot in front of the other, which both have uh, the one foot in front of the other. And in the front pose, you have that still as well. One of the key differences in the front pose is that the arms are very straight and rigid, and you have the hands clasped. And here it looks like they're holding, you know, this little like pole or something because that was to create that clasped image. Um, you, this was the, this was the idealization pose. And this is what was the standard pose that they did and was most common. You, again, usually for showcasing the Pharaoh. Here we can see with the headdress that this was a Pharaoh. Um, and, and then, so it's always with the idealization, the arms in front with the hands clasped at the side the narrower hip with wider um, uh, shoulders, and then the foot in front of the other. Um, and that was uh, a consistent uh, pose that went with the hierarchical structure. Here we get to see both idealism and naturalism. Uh, on the right, you have a pharaoh sitting down. Um, and again, that rigid structure, although the arms are now on the lap because you can't have it down with the chair, um, and the feet can't go in front, um, because they're not standing. But if you look at the lines that I'm drawing, right, it's this linear, uh, um, uh, use of the lines, uh, straight lines to indicate, uh, direction of, of sitting in pose. And this was that idealization. Again, it, it's not realistic, but he doesn't have a stomach. He's got some muscles. It still is more um, meant to 
put off this sense of power and authority. And part of that reason for that standardization, right, is that um, where you have the naturalism pose here with this scribe where he has some of a stomach. Um, you actually have more of an identification of a face in a lot of the idealism or uh, idealization. Uh, their face has some characteristic, but it's not as detailed. And here you have more um, kind of uh, not only a, a facial expression, but detail that way. You don't have uh, the body showcases um, more realistic look of not as flat of a stomach, right? Looking like he has some weight, a little bit of weight to him. And then, of course, the pose, right? He's sitting cross-legged. Um, rather than what you never would see in an uh, idealization. They had the set poses, which we were looking at for the paintings, and then a few set po uh, poses for the sculptures. This was the sitting pose with the pharaoh here on idealization, and then here this was the standing pose. And you had that, just like in the um, poses in the art for the pyramid art, that's what you used, but with uh, naturalism, they had a little more leeway. Again, this was less common um, than um, uh, the other. So the poses don't uh, follow the rules for the statues. Let's put that on here too. You have a standing pose and sitting pose. For the um, temples and pyramids then, Uh, the, the purpose of those were to show power and authority, right? And then um, connection to the gods. So the, the architecture was also very much a, a specific theme and idea of what they wanted to showcase. All right, and then uh, last... We have um, changes in the New Kingdom. Uh, as I had been mentioning that there was some uh, change in the New Kingdom uh, be with art and that had to do with one pharaoh, Akhenaten. Akhenaten um, was, did not follow any of what we were supposed to do in um, the New Kingdom. By the New Kingdom, the pharaoh was supposed to be more involved with the people uh, they were supposed to visit temples for uh, rituals. In fact, they actually were much more like a Mesopotamian king. In the Old and Middle Kingdom, pharaohs were not expected to be seen or visible. They um, were not a shepherd to the people. Um, they, warfare wasn't an emphasis. Um, it, not everything that was we talked about with what made a good king in Mesopotamia had nothing to do with the pharaoh in the Old um, and Middle Kingdom. In the New Kingdom, because of the loss of Mott, it had shifted to now where the pharaoh kind of had to justify why he had his power and control. So they did that through warfare and showing them as good hunters. They did that through being present and visible by visiting the temples, which for the first time in the New Kingdom, people really visited the temples for uh, religious rituals to uh, connect to the gods. The temples were in the Old and Middle Kingdom were really there for, and we could put that right here, uh, back up here, temples in the Old Kingdom and Middle Kingdom were connected to the pyramids and the priest. People did not visit them often for religious services or anything like that, but in the New Kingdom, it was for the people, for, for uh, religious rituals and connection to the gods. So you had a fundamental change in all of that. Akhenaten rejected all of those things. He moved the palace out into the middle of nowhere. He was recluse. He was not a warrior. He didn't showcase himself hunting. And he changed the religion. Um, he, uh, this doesn't last. It only lasted during Akhenaten. He changed the religion to, actually it's in his name, Aten, which is the sun disk. And uh, it was worship of the sun disk. And he actually took away the whole moral component of religion and the afterlife and said only the royal family gets an afterlife. Um, and no one liked it. And that, as soon as he died, 
was reversed back to the way it was. However, one of the other things he changed with all of this was in art. Specifically, getting rid of, of less to no hierarchical uh, images. He also went more for the um, uh, naturalist uh, and realistic portrayal of, of the pharaoh. All of a sudden cannot write there. So it shows him with a stomach. It shows him of accurate size, which is also why you don't have the hierarchical um, uh, images if you're trying to show actual size. He also wanted uh, the artist to show, have him show affection with his kids and wife, which was also not done um, at that time. And then uh, there were just more um, images uh, of, of art of, of life, right? So he encouraged where you had plants and animals, not for the sake just to show them, right? Art for the sake of art. Uh, you had um, plants and animals before, but they were always in the past connected to the um, pyramid text, the pyramid in art, right? So it was connected to showing rituals or uh, functions for the afterlife. Now, uh, Akhenaten has said, just, you know, you want to draw a flower, draw a flower. Uh, let's showcase this person in the market. Let's do this. Like, paint, do art for the sake of art, uh, to show life, right? Not, not, uh, and it could be daily life. It could be obscure things. It, it, it was just, uh, to have art. And this does end up creating, um, uh, an acceptance of, of actually what you consider artists, right? The priests were artists but artists that were not priests. And the art does stick with Akhenaten um, after, the, after his death, while the, all the other changes he made reverted back, um, uh, this new art remained. Now, one of the things that does come back is hierarchical images. All the pharaohs after Akhenaten, uh, besides his son, King Tut, used hierarchical scale a lot. However, um, they didn't get rid of the new art. Uh, and so in the, after Akhenaten in the New Kingdom, you have um, that um, showcasing, um, uh, you know, like I said, just whatever artists wanted to do and it became acceptable to be an artist um, rather than just a priest who did the art for the pharaoh and the gods and the rituals and, and the connection that way. And you had people that just uh, showcased whatever they wanted to within life. So this is Akhenaten. Um, and uh, here you can see, and this one, there's another one um, uh, that showcases him uh, sitting with his wife and children and he's kissing one of his kids and he's the same size as his wife. Again, in a lot of the hierarchical art, the wife would be down here, tiny. Um, but he, he has a stomach. He has more unique, narrow facial features that don't, doesn't relate with it. The other thing you can see is, look, if you look at the shoulder to hip ratio, it does not fit those uh, rules that all of the other sculptures had. Also, his pose, although this is uh, uh, one pose that was used for, that the pharaoh did for, to showcase his, uh, the ceremony for coronation. Um, but he had other ones where he wasn't using those, those kind of two main, uh, poses. And then one of the other things that often is noticed that he always seems to have a really long, um, headgear. And there was speculation that he actually had an elongated head. And so if that's the case, like they were showcasing that in the art as well. Um, so that was, that was a, a, a lasting change in art during the New Kingdom. Okay, so that's where we're stopping with Egyptian art. Um, we will look at Greek art next. Um, 
Um, but that is it for Mesopotamia, prehistory, prehistoric art, Mesopotamia, and Egyptian art.